Gotham City has always struggled with crime. Even before orphaned billionaire Bruce Wayne took up the cowl as Batman and fought for a safer and brighter day, crime has always reared its ugly head. Corruption and senseless violence have always plagued the city. Bruce Wayne seeks to change that, through being both a cocky but lion-hearted billionaire playboy philanthropist and the Dark Knight, he has worked tirelessly to stamp out crime and deal with the countless occurrences of said crime, both the mundane and the fantastical. Through his tireless work, Batman is understood as a symbol, his Bat logo not only a calling card for his brand and presence, but a warning to all those who would hurt others for their own gain. The Batman Arkham video game series is a prime example of said war against crime and its beneficiaries. Throughout its core four games, he faces off against countless physically and mentally dangerous foes, but few understand that trying to beat Batman through straight warfare will never work. Wayne is a man, not immune to knives, bullets, and gunfire, but Batman's presence is on the symbolic plane gives him qualities that cannot be punctured or burned. How can you hurt a symbol, something you can't touch? It's only fitting that Batman's most monstrous and dangerous villain understands that very, very well. Perhaps more than Bruce himself. The war he waged against the Dark Knight uses an overwhelming amount of physical force to accomplish its goal as something to distract Batman rather than best him in combat. Batman's greatest threat is not his crime or any sort of mortal wound, not even the Joker, but rather, his own mind. This villain has accomplished something that no one else in Arkham ever had that little to no Batman characters period have ever achieved, and likely will achieve. He broke Batman fundamentally. His symbol was unwound and exposed, which left him unable to continue as the Dark Knight. While being physically alive at the end of the ordeal, Batman died a spiritual death and paid the price for it. Someone who is willing to trample hundreds of millions of men, women, and children for his goals Someone who likes to see people squirm and beg for mercy, or death, whichever comes sooner. Only one man can be responsible for all this, and his name is Scarecrow. You are the product of everything you fear. Violence, darkness, helplessness. I will cut that mask from your face, and the whole world will see the fear in your eyes. I don't care who you are, but they will no more Batman. In the Arkham series, Scarecrow starts as just as any other version of him would. Dr. Jonathan Crane, inspired after years of childhood torment, would concoct a deadly fear toxin that caused viral hallucinations of a victim's worst fear once it entered the lungs. He frequently tested on Blackgate prisoners during Batman's earliest years as the Caped Crusader, even being inside Blackgate when Loeb was gassed by the then Black Mask disguised Joker in the Arkham Origins intro. Torn flyers around Gotham reveal that Crane was more than willing to subject anyone who signed a dubious contract to being his lab rat to test his toxin. Fast forward into Arkham Asylum, where Crane's sadism and unquenched thirst for unethical experimentation and research led him to don his Scarecrow persona, and subsequently be incarcerated in Arkham Asylum once caught by Batman. Despite being a patient-slash-prisoner, he was able to maintain a hidden laboratory inside the intensive treatment center, armed with blueprints of Arkham floors along with several cameras to track everybody's movements. Despite his frequent assaults, Batman was able to overcome his dosages of toxin and corner a desperate crane in the Arkham sewers. Too late, Batman! One step closer and this goes into the water. The cave will fill with your deepest, darkest nightmares. And you will never reach your precious venom roots. <laughs> Don't do it, Crane. <laughs> Fast 
faced with the reality of Crane's likely death, Batman quickly retrieves the items needed to stop the Joker's takeover of Asylum and leaves. This is the last we see of Crane. Until. One of the three endings you can obtain at the end of Arkham Asylum shows him grabbing onto a rogue crate of Titan formula, meaning Crane has survived his ordeal with Croc. This is where Arkham Scarecrow and regular Scarecrow diverge paths forever. Any player of Asylum knows how Crane acts in the game. He delights in his actions against his fellow man and takes immense, almost comical pleasure in exposing people's darkest fears to empower himself to exploit people. It's always been about power for him. The gas is merely his leveraging tool to make others feel small and become subservient to him. When Crane is taken by Croc in the sewers, he is completely defenseless against a monstrously strong foe that can physically abuse him as he sees fit. Croc inflicts massive trauma on Crane physically and mentally, but what is critical about the situation is that Crane is made to feel small and being physically dominated by someone else, which twists a deeply personal knife into his gut. Crane's life is spared, or he seemingly escapes the situation, but his true fate remains ambiguous until the final game of the series unless you look carefully. In Asylum's sequel, Arkham City, several canisters of his signature fear gas can be spotted around the map. Inside one of Riddler's hostage rooms and inside the secret base of the identity killer within the city, which highly implies that he met both men and likely sold them the toxin in exchange for money. This is where we can find a key trait of Scarecrow's that makes him so dangerous, his diplomacy. Despite his appearance, Scarecrow is exceptionally good at brokering deals with the other big names in Gotham City to get what he wants, even appearing as frequent alumni to the Joker himself. The industrial district of Arkham City reveals much more of his whereabouts. His mask from Asylum can be found on piles of straw, a dark premonition of what's to come. A lone boat by the shores of the bay can also be found. Astute player is using the cryptographic sequencer and entering the password City of Terror to access a secret hideout. Inside, an invoice order for the hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of insects ordered from the Falconius inside of a secret base. A lone Joker thug can be seen screaming for dear life, then passing out from exhaustion, likely as a test subject of his newest strain of toxins. There are subtle clues and hints, but it's highly implied that Scarecrow hid inside the boat during the events around Arkham City, and carefully, oh so carefully, plotted his revenge. Returning to the sequencer, we can find some strange frequencies that spout some seemingly meaningless numbers in an endless loop. What these numbers actually are, are a cryptographic sequence that can be decoded by using a base cipher to transcribe the letter with the corresponding descending letter, i.e. A equals 1 and Z equals 26. Armed with this information, we can decode some threatening messages. Broadcast 700 over 500. I will return, Batman. Broadcast 500 over 900. You will pay for what you have done to me. The last broadcast, this one requires additional sleuthing. You have to use the at bash method, which is an additional encryption method used for the Hebrew alphabet. By combining this, we get fear will tear Gotham to shreds. Beyond any shadow of a doubt, Scarecrow is planning something for Gotham. Our clues are scant, but we can determine two things. Scarecrow has been brokering some of Gotham's most recognizable threats, and some up-and-comers, and that he is very, very angry. What form does that wrath take? The very beginning of Arkham Knight sees the hostile takeover of a small diner with only 5 ounces of his newest fear toxin. Scarecrow's mangled visage gives Gotham a single warning. Evacuate now, or all fall prey to his toxin. Scarecrow's new appearance is uncomfortable, to say the least. Abandoned are his rags and instead replaced by canister of fear toxin all around his person, fashioned as an explosive vest and a bandolier. 
He is cloaked and hooded like a reaper of souls, his gauntlet of talks and acting as his scythe. The hangman's noose around his neck makes him look like a corpse, reanimated by his vengeance to burn Gotham to the ground. His leg brace, missing nose, lack of lips, and cloudy eyes show to what extent Scarecrow has been mutilated by Croc. Of course, you can't avoid the most disturbing aspect of his person. His face, or rather lack of. Whispers from his own hired militia hint that Scarecrow intentionally sewed the mask onto what remained of his face. His own subordinates and other villains in Gotham become squeamish and unsettled to merely gaze at his ghoulish face. The exact details are left ambiguous, but given the fear toxin inside the identity thief's personal hideout, I don't think it would be much of a stretch for someone gifted in facial surgery to have operated on Scarecrow in exchange for some toxin. The threat of the entire city being doused in toxin requires the police to evacuate absolutely everybody, leaving behind only rioters and criminals inside Gotham's walls. During the chaos, we see the second core tenant of Scarecrow's plan, the militia. Audio files in-game reveal that Scarecrow's personal guards were previously killed by a newcomer to Gotham, the Arkham Knight. You should invest in better guards, Crane. And you should invest in some manners. Who are you? Another pretender to the cow? Call me the Arkham Knight. <laughs> Another child of the asylum set free. Tell me, what tortured soul cowers behind that mask? It doesn't matter who I am, I'm here because we want the same thing. Batman's dead. <laughs> you made short work of my guard, but Batman is a very different proposition. One for which I am fully prepared. Those guards I killed, I could replace them with an army. An army trained in his methods. Trained by whom? Me. And what would you know about Batman? His fear. Very well. You have my attention, Arkham Knight. Their deal was set in stone, but with one major source of controversy. Batman must be left alive until the plan is done. If you want him dead, why come to me? You seem capable. He needs to suffer. I suffered. So he will too. So, it's personal. Well, there are many in this city with a gift for causing harm. Not that kind of pain. The real kind. Uh, you want him afraid. I've seen what your toxin does. I want that. You're well informed about all of us Arkham Knights. But you're wrong about something. I don't want Batman dead. I want him unmade. He's better off dead. Kill him and you martyr him. You make him a legend, but break him, humiliate him, terrify him, and hold him up for the world to see. Then he's nothing but a man. Look, you can do what you want, Crane, but when you're done, I will kill him. Very well, but know this. It will be an act of mercy when you do. To secure the funds necessary to hire the militia, Scarecrow re-emerged into Gotham and reunited with several other criminals. Everyone was there. Penguin, Two-Face, Riddler, even poor Harley. Scarecrow said he had a plan. That together we could take you out, and Gotham would be ours. With the exception of Ivy, everyone agreed and paid a portion of the two billion dollar total fee and brought in dozens of armed drones, tanks, cars, and armored guns into the city, as well as planting several bombs around Gotham if anyone tries to intervene from the outside, which explains why there's such a lack of Justice League despite their obvious existence in this universe. Scarecrow's plan is very complicated and multifaceted, so we'll need to break it down piece by piece. The Arkham Knight linked up with Scarecrow, and Scarecrow took other Gotham villains under his wing to let them wreak havoc as they saw fit in exchange for his protection. From there, the player is given choice, chase after Scarecrow right away or take care of the side militias and rioters. Regardless of your choice, Scarecrow will be taunting you from the television screens he's hacked into. The country watches Batman from Metropolis to Keystone. We're going to give them a show. 
Scarecrow took refuge in the Ace Chemicals building, revealing that his bomb far, far exceeded what anyone would have predicted. You don't know the half of it, Batman. Scarecrow, he was... Stay calm and tell me what you know. They've been running the plant for hours. They brought in trucks, weapons, soldiers, shipments of hazardous materials. They knew exactly what they were doing. He's producing his toxin on a massive scale. It's a bad. Real bad. We're talking about a gas cloud that could cover the entire eastern seaboard. The entire American eastern seaboard is typically depicted of Connecticut, Delaware, Maine, Maryland, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, New York, New Jersey, Vermont, the Carolinas, Georgia, Florida, Rhode Island, Pennsylvania, and Virginia. That's at least 15 states directly clouded by a toxin that brings out your worst fear in a hallucination. Let's do some math. I've taken direct numbers from Wikipedia's 2020 population consensus forms. So Connecticut has 3,606,944 people. Delaware has 989,948. Maine has 1,362,359. Maryland has 6,177,224. Massachusetts has 7,029,917. New Hampshire is 1,377,529. New York has 20,201,249. New Jersey has 9,288,944. Vermont has 643,700. The Carolinas have a combined total of 15,577,813. Georgia has 10,711,908,000. Florida has a 21,538,187. Rhode Island has 1,997,379. Pennsylvania has 13,002,700. And Virginia has 8,631,393. Adding all these numbers together, we get 120,236,591. people. people. Over 120 million people are collateral damage to Scarecrow. This... This is his most dangerous trait. Joker, for all his malice and wanton destruction, has never concocted a plan like this outside of extreme, extreme Black Label continuity stuff. And I must stress, this is all just to torment Batman. The depths of Scarecrow's loathing for Batman has become so vile that he is willing to infect a third of the entire population of America, at least just to torment him to remind him that he failed. Letting Gotham's population run was not to spare their lives, but rather to watch them squirm in a cage while they are helplessly trapped by an abuser. Those who die, however, may be the lucky ones. Survivor of the fear toxin can be left with irreparable mental damage, exceptionally traumatized by whatever ordeal they've been hallucinated. If by a miracle from God and no one dies from the toxin, it would still result in the worst humanitarian and mental health crisis ever seen on the planet, bar none. Think about it, a hundred million people deeply traumatized and broken in an instant, at the very least. These are not people to Scarecrow, these are acres of skin and bone, they are collateral and leverage. This willingness to commit potential nine digit genocide is nothing to how he reacts to being confronted. Do you really think you've won? Fear makes you predictable. I am in complete control. How do I shut it down? Let me go, or she dies. What are you talking about? Barbara. Gordon. Have you found him? Get out of there. Now. Relax. No one knows I'm here. Hmm. 
Nothing hurts like losing one of the family. Knowing that there is no one to blame but yourself. He is so confident in his plan that he willingly surrender and make himself harmless, using it as an opportunity to escape Batman and inform him that he has taken Barbara Gordon. Well, he has every reason to be confident, because his plan goes off without a hitch, and Batman is unable to save her. Barbara! Yes, you see it now. The horror behind the glass. No. The monster that will be your end, unless you pick up that gun and deny him. No. Don't listen! Barbara, it's me! Your friend! You won't get me. I won't let you get me. You will bring death to all who follow you. At least he thinks so. Revealed late into the main campaign, Scarecrow kept her under the control of the Arkham Knight in order to manipulate and blackmail Jim Gordon against Batman, who had become wrought with anger once he learned that Batman was not able to save Barbara. It's here where a key aspect of his plan becomes obvious, using everything he can against Batman. Batman's city, family, country, and identity were all under attack. Things only get worse when Batman tracks him down to the Stag airship. <laughs> it's in this encounter where Scarecrow infects Batman formally with the toxin, whilst Batman is already infected with Joker's tainted blood from Arkham City. The double dipping causes a permanent break in Bruce's mind, which leads him to mentally shoot and kill Scarecrow right then and there. You need to do something. You need to stop him. Good. 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 At this point in the story, Batman's morality was all he had left. With a very few exceptions, his family is gone, his city is ruined, and his legacy has been stamped on. Now that Batman broke his no-kill rule, he is no longer Batman. He is just a man. And Scarecrow knows this. Something's changed. You're different. He broke something deep. Bruce. The city of fear is activated, dousing his own men into the fear toxin as it completely coats Gotham City. Batman's brave journey into Ace Chemicals prevented the blast from spreading into Gotham further, but the damage was long since done to its inhabitants. Ivy's later sacrifice leading to the city's air being cleaned, Batman has to swallow a tough pill in order to defeat Scarecrow. Death is necessary. The physical, the mental, the spiritual, all Scarecrow wants is for Batman to suffer. However, a wild card proves to cause some problems in his plan. The Arkham Knight. He went against orders and tried to kill Batman multiple times, which led to his and Scarecrow's falling out. Batman is horrified to discover that indeed the Knight is Jason Todd, whom he was having vivid hallucinations about due to both his own anxiety about the situation and the effects of the Joker blood and Scarecrow's toxin. Scarecrow eventually gives Batman a final warning after he takes Jim and later a captive Robin hostage in Batman's otherwise unused movie base. Turn yourself in and save them, or they die. Completely out of options, Batman gives in. A truck drives the unarmed Batman to where it all began for the franchise, as well as Scarecrow's dark rebirth, the Arkham Asylum. Armed to the teeth with cameras and his family hostage, Batman but has no choice but to let Scarecrow unmask him in front of everybody. It's 
from that point on, Batman cannot exist. The final nails in the coffin of Batman have been revealed. Batman is no longer a rumor, a symbolic figure, but exposed as a man in a costume. In his own words, Afraid. A sudden double crossing from Jason Todd frees Wayne, which leads him to inject the rest of the sphere toxin into the Scarecrow, which completely shatters his mind. By the end of the campaign proper, Scarecrow is not considered a physical or mental threat, but look at the damage he's caused. Gotham is forever changed physically and spiritually, no longer confident in Batman's ability to fight crime. Symbolically, Scarecrow won the war. He broke Batman by taking everything he held dear. Batman may feel guilt for failing to save people like Talia and Joker, but with Scarecrow, he made Batman mentally shoot him. With the full knowledge of Wayne's costumed identity, he later returns to his house to activate the Nightfall Protocol, which explodes and completely crumbles, leading to the public belief that he is dead. In a situation not unlike Bruce's own childhood, a couple and their young son go through the alleyway to escape traffic, only to find some petty thugs ready to mug them. Even after being confronted by an ambiguous, bat-shaped, fiery figure, they remind they aren't being afraid of Wayne anymore. Remember this. It'll come up later. Scarecrow's list of accomplishments in Arkham Knight speaks for itself. He was more than willing to commit genocide, destroy families, and sow unimaginable chaos and deeply personal fears and trauma just to torment Wayne's costumed identity. That's what it was all about. He wanted to expose and completely destroy the concept of heroic vigilanteism. Scarecrow has completely lost himself in the persona, fully embracing the costume and potentially forcing Wayne to do the same. Crane died in those sewers, and what remained was Scarecrow. He became a Scarecrow for Gotham, and Batman, in his mind, was the prey. It's highly likely that the death of his own identity as well is what caused his mental decline and to become so dangerous. And potentially worse, he might have inflicted the same fate on Wayne. Do you recall the fiery bat from the last scene? It's highly theorized that Wayne faked his and Alfred's death in the final cutscene, which would give him infinite time to be Batman and no longer have to keep up social appearances of Bruce Wayne, essentially making him entirely a costumed man. As one last final twist of the knife, Scarecrow laid the dark foundations for Bruce to walk on, fully devoted to being a vigilante and not a man. The fire and chaos in that last scene is theorized not to be actual fire, but rather an effect of the fear toxin, the shot being taken from a POV from the thugs. If that theory is true, and Wayne chooses to use some form of Scarecrow's toxin for his own gain, how deep would the wound Scarecrow inflicted? How much did he have an effect on Wayne's mind if he chose to later use his own version of the fear toxin for his own gain? The fear toxin that was previously threatened to kill hundreds of millions, now in the hands of Batman. Not Bruce Wayne, Batman. Those wounds Scarecrow inflicted are deeply personal, evil, and manipulative. His cunning, tactics, diplomacy, hatred, and diabolical determinations make him an object of unfathomable terror. One can only fear a man who has nothing to lose, but all to gain. This is why Scarecrow is Batman's darkest villain. It's okay. It's not okay! You know what this means. It's the end. When they find out who you are, there'll be no hiding. You need to trust me, Jim. Hey, did you like the video? I hope you did, because I got something real special for you. I've asked a good friend of mine, who's also a great artist, check him out, give him a follow, he's really good, who was an expert on all things Batman and Batman comics, and I've asked him to give us an interview. This will only be auditory, so relax and enjoy a snippet of the audio. The raw audio folder is about an hour, and it'll release a bit later. Don't worry about it. Enjoy. Recording now. Excellent. So, Excellent. I've got the notepad here. I want right. to ask you the first question... I know you didn't see all of it because you had something to do, but how did you feel about the video? Like, did you agree with what I had to say and how I presented it? 
Well, I we talked a, a bit about it before, you know, just because yeah, I was I wouldn't say I was like involved in the writing process. No, I kind of just told you it was happening. Yeah, uh, I did. I did on the broad notes agree. I have interpretations of the character a bit different because, you know, I'm I've been in this game of pouring over stupid people in costumes for ages. Yeah, no, but I'm, I'm kind of a newcomer, I will say. I, I agree on the broad strokes. I really like the pre like, let me say, I did really dig the presentation. I would say on the broad strokes, I agree. Okay, like there's some kind of like the nitty gritty details of my interpretation that didn't sit well, or? Not as much as just, I, I think like, I agree with all the details, but my end is kind of different, you know? Okay. But I don't like Rises, but you could I would consider it true to a version of the character. While this, I would say the Arkham series, specifically Knight, is kind of a downward spiral into this, like, absolute darkness, which I think, like, uh, that's what you were kind of... Yeah, like, things Focusing kind of on. get worse for New Jersey versus yeah. things getting a little bit more ideal. Like, it's almost, I wouldn't say Superman tone, but it does feel very Death of Superman-y by the end of Rises yeah. versus uh, the act of, like, continental terrorism. Right. Uh, I will ask the next question. We're getting a little right. bit off topic for that one, but it's okay. <laughs> a bit, it's yeah. Okay. Uh, next one. In... So, specifically retaining to Arkham, how do you feel about Scarecrow as a character in all, or I would say four, he's only really a major part of two, but in general in the series, how would you feel about Jonathan Crane? I would say he's probably the best adaptation of the character. I think, uh, specifically the Arkham version, he's kind of the star of the game in a lot of ways, in Asylum specifically, because I, his segments are... They're, they get you most when you play them first. They're a little bit of a drag on replays, but presentation-wise, it's it's um, it feels misleading to say they're the heart of the game, but they're very much like the embodiment a of what. Focus. Yeah, they're they're the like weird nightmarish gothic quality like manifesting. Specifically, the transition into night from Asylum, which I, we got off a bit off topic again. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I think specifically that transition is really strong because you get this build up where, like, uh, in city specifically, you get this, you get the experimentation, you get the boat, all that stuff. I think there was more to be had, but I like the idea that they made him the main villain in the end because he he's definitely his own character and there's a lot of like depth there yeah, I, know, I know many him. people accused joker of stealing the spotlight but at least i think they shared it pretty well because no, yeah they they both had their own different parallelism because yeah if you'll notice the scarecrow face is a bat symbol turned upside down yeah with two eyes I I uh I think specifically there's this like they they kind of represent like an inside and outside of Batman's psyche if I'm going to say if that makes sense a lot but it does if that makes sense that. because um obviously you know one is literally inside his head but there's this like Specifically in relation to this game being kind of the downward spiral into darkness. The Joker storyline is specifically him, like, internalizing his own insanity. Because I think even if he wasn't infected with Joker's blood, there would have been something that made him question his own sanity. Because this whole series is kind of iterative. Is that how you pronounce that word? Most likely not. But um, it's iterative on Killing Joke a bit. As kind of a sub-question of that, how do you think right. this version of Scarecrow 
works against the other adaptations of him like just in general like would you say you prefer mm. one version over the other or is there certain like character traits you would notice i would say this version is definitely the most developed you get a lot of time with all the villains in this game so it'd be hard for me not to say one is the most developed they at least in the arkham series give a good reason for his um transition into just a guy in like a mask to being a grotesque deformed corpse looking thing he, I mean, as he in sewed it croc mangled him face, yeah. which i i did propose the theory that hush kind of helped him with that given the toxin i can see that though i will say that arkham scarecrow definitely has a thing for theatrics yeah he i love to, it he's very over dramatic in both games because I find in a lot of other media, he likes just to corner people one on one, and like bully them. Yeah. Versus this one, I've... where he's got like a, like an Al Qaeda terrorist kind of vibe, yeah. where he wants to broadcast it to the whole. I, I think that works specifically very well against Arkham Batman, who is all about. Um, in the last game, you drive a car through eighty percent of the game. That's a fucking tank. It's all about the theatrics of fear, and I love it. It's a very good take on the character. I think he's, he's the strongest interpretation of the character by a long shot, which isn't to say that I don't like the others. I, I just think this one's this kind of like... Not, uh, most of them don't have the level of detail, because he's not, yeah, he's, they're, not a, he's not a main lister, typically. He's a yeah, side he's, he's a sometimes villain. He's like, you know, every 50th story they'll use him. Yeah. Though, and something I did notice is that this is probably the darkest Scarecrow we got. Even in Asylum, yeah. he was pretty goofy. Yeah. Like, he more just wanted to spook you in a mask. Even yeah. Though, I mean, he, he went to jail <laughs> for more, like, I think experimentation and, like, just yeah. making people spooked versus mass murdering. And I did. I don't mind it because part of me does, like, the spirit halloween dude in a costume with fear gas but i definitely like the he does weird... like halloween because arkham knight yeah takes place on halloween. I, I i do like the um i like this for this legitimate version a lot more but i also don't mind it just being a dude in rags that has like some fucked up he's just chemical. a sadist all right well i think i have to um okay yeah that's the last start, question right. anyways yeah uh, have fun cutting that down to 10 minutes. <laughs> Sin, Sin City was a mafia.